Today I'm joined by a very good friend of mine. His name is Omondio Chuka. My name is Omondio Chuka. I am 27 years old. I am a poet, a writer, I'm a thinker, and I'm a cancer survivor. When I'm not doing all that, I teach sometimes, part-time. I love art, I love nature, I love people, I love thinking, I love music. Yeah, that's me. All right, first of all, let's talk about your art. My art? Which one? You're an artist. Yeah, I'm an artist and I do a lot of art, different arts. I'm a painter now. I am uh, a poet, uh, I'm a writer, and uh, I'm uh, a rapper, yeah. All right, and, and do you earn a living from it? Or do you do it for...? Well, for me, I think art for me is therapy. Uh, I use it as a way of expressing myself, but mostly in terms of killing myself holistically. I mean, in my mind, I also use it to document my life, what I'm going through. It's more like a journal, yeah. But, well, I cannot say that I earn a living from it, although sometimes you get a few coins here and there, but that's good. Okay. Yeah. Where did you grow up? I grew up in a lot of places. I grew up in Nairobi. I grew up in the village. I grew up in Kampala, El Pato, Dallas, US, yeah, and basically I'm all over the world a bit. I'm a village boy, but also yeah, town boy a bit. I'm a twin soul in, in, in that sense. You're pretty deep. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your choice of words. <laughs> okay, and yeah, all right. So basically you've been there and that, like yeah. you've really seen I'm, it all. Yes. How, yes. How, how, how has that shifted your perception of life? I think in a way it, was, it, was, it, it has been more transitional. Until the age of 12, I'd lived in three cities and I'd also lived in the village. My grandparents, I'd lived with my grandparents as, as I was, since I was very young. In fact, I have never, I've never overhauled the idea that my grandparents are not my real parents. Yeah, so I, I, they made it a custom to actually go to the village when schools were closed, whenever we found any opportunity to, to go to the village. And I tended to like the village, the rustic village life, the more organic village life. I remember I love grazing, you know, going out with the cattle you know, milking or learning to milk, you know, putting the cows inside the shed. The village, learning the luo, you know, because I didn't grow up, I didn't grow up with it. And basically just, you know, the philosophy of the people back in the village, the ways of life, the day-to-day -day activities, farming, you know, yeah, singing and all that, church, yeah. I love that more than the town life. But both of them have sort of made me, they've given me a, uh, a very, I could say, a very, very consistent worldview where I am not ignorant on so many facts. I can be able to fit anywhere, and that I think that's I'm really appreciative of that. Yeah. yeah. Do you do you have other siblings? No, I'm the only sibling. Ooh. Yeah. You must be spoiled rotten. No, I'm I not. I'm not. I, I can't say I'm the only sibling, but I, I would also say that it's a yes and a no one because. Uh, between my mother and my father, I am the only child. Mm -hmm. okay. But my mother is married elsewhere, mm -hmm. so I have other half-siblings. But you know, in most African cultures, there is no half-sibling. They are your siblings. Your siblings. And I even do not want to separate that. Mm -hmm. So I also have siblings. And, uh, well, my grandmother was a hell of a disciplinarian, so there's no way I was going to be rotten. I read somewhere that you have a child? Oh yeah, I do have a daughter. I have two daughters. Okay. I always say that. Okay. But one did make it through. Too bad. Yeah, the okay. twin, uh, it's okay. The twin made it through. One, half of the twin. <laughs> yeah, she's nine years old. So Ooh. both of them are nine years old. Oh, yes. oh you, you, you had twins. Yeah. <laughs> when was the first time that you were diagnosed with cancer? I was diagnosed with cancer of the liver in 2011, November. There is like Eight years, ago. eight years ago in November 12th, it will be eight years. How old were exactly. you? Exactly, I was 19 years old. Super young, yeah, pretty, a bit young. Yeah, you in school? Yeah, I was in college, the yeah. first year. Okay. Yeah. Were in Kenya, or? yeah, here, here in Kenya, in University of Nairobi. Yes. How did you get to a point where you were diagnosed? Weren't you, were you not feeling well? Like, was it like a reg was it a regular visit to the doctor? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, not really. Uh, it's very funny. I think most people, most people either 
most people have like what is called you know the process of developing then one day maybe they go to to the whole sea and then they check you out they tell you go back you don't find anything or you find other diseases mine i had this really bad ache at the back ache for some time so I used to go to the sick bay at the university and they would give you maybe ibuprofen and all that. Yeah, the, the painkillers yeah, too. Even, yeah, even yeah. and then they just go back. It'll be okay. I go back. And then there's a day I went after, I think it was around 10-ish, before I went to the 11, the, the 11 p.m. class. No, the 11 a.m. class. And, uh, well, I went to the sick bay and I couldn't come out. I was Ooh. so sick. I was having fever and I was, you know, they, so that they admitted me. And the second day I got worse. So they told me now, the sick bay cannot handle your case. We have to refer you to KNH. Well, what what was the diagnosis when they admitted you? What no, were they, they treating? Yeah. No, they, they, were, I was, they were saying malaria. I know. Yeah, because I traveled to see my dana, of course. Right. Yeah, so that was like a probable cause. Yeah. Did, did they test or they were just assuming? They tested. Oh, um, oh you, and you tested positive yeah, for malaria? positive for malaria. Oh, okay. But still, they couldn't explain why I had the backache. But you know, malaria has a lot of you know symptoms and all that. Yeah. So they referred me to KNH, and I did like a lot of tests and did a lot of scans, yeah. and uh, they were pretty clean. What came up was something called spina bifida, which is where like the vertebrae split. It's something congenital, which means one is born with it. Yeah, I think I've heard about it. Yeah. yeah. So it's not supposed to be an issue for me. It wasn't supposed to be an issue for me. I could maybe do a few sessions of physiotherapy and it would be good. But now I started like I was admitted and then I consulted the PD clinic for two months and then the pain got like away. It was good. So I was Whoa. back to my studies. On a Friday, we are after, cha after like class, we're chatting outside. And the next thing I know, I used to love headphones. I love music. The music is always on my ears. Yeah. Yeah, the head for is, is falling and I'm like falling and I'm convulsing. Whoa. Yeah. So the next thing I know, I'm waking up and I'm finding some nurse. Like after that, you just blacked yeah, out. Yeah, blacked. There's a blank space between, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. yeah. So when I wake up, I find myself with a stranger in some uniform. And then I, I asked her, where am I? And I said, yeah, just chill, just chill. You were at the Gukan hospital, you brought here by your friends, you had a convulsion, and after that, you passed out. Ooh. Yes. So they're saying, oh, we do not know exactly what might have caused your convulsion, but we're doing a couple of tests. We've already done a few. The doctor will come and will talk to you with his team, and then they'll recommend a few other tests to be done so that we can be sure this is what, what, is, uh, what might have caused your convulsion. And uh, in the afternoon, the doctor comes and, you know, yeah, they tell me, yeah, we have to, you look yellow, you look jaundiced. Yeah, you look. So we have our own, uh, we have our, we, we, we can hypothesize, we, we, we can guess, we have our guesses, but we are not for certain that this is, we can't know for certain that this is the case. So we, have to, until after we do the test, this is when we know. But our best guesses, if you allow us to tell you, we can tell you. Right. I was like, okay, I was a very easy person. So yeah, they told me it's either you have your liver has a problem, or uh, or you have jaundice, or you have yellow fever, or things just within those ranges. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they recommended that I do a, a biopsy, I do some ultrasound, and then I do an MRI. Yeah, so I have to wait. That was on a Sunday. I had to wait until Tuesday. So they asked me. So, so you were just in the hospital yeah, that whole yeah, time. Yeah, the whole time. So they asked me, now do you want to call someone? That's the point I knew. Okay, now this point of calling someone. My booth is cooked. Yeah. Why do yeah, I need to call someone? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, um, pretty much okay. You can tell me whatever you want to tell that other person. During that period, you're just alone. Yeah, I'm just yeah, alone. You, you told guys, you told your people you were admitted, but no need. Yeah, no you're need. Being a man yeah. about it. No, no. I told like I remember I called my grandmother and also <laughs> told my friends when they came to visit. I told them, oh, they're still doing their thing, you know. When your we have. Yeah, when your you grandma must really be your person. Yeah, she's my person, mm -hmm. I you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, I tell them, you know, it's not a, such a big deal. We'll, we'll get out of here. Yeah, so on Tuesday, they come back with my biopsy, and yeah, you have liver cancer in the stage two. They told you. Yeah. What was it like? Well, I always tell people I just laughed. I was just smiling. I don't know why exactly. Maybe it was sort of some expression of indifference. Or it was just me 
mocking it trying to like understand is it real? really yeah like, oh, like i mean yeah we were, the other day we were, talk, we were talking about malaria now yeah now we're talking, we're talking cancer, cancer like, you know did you is it a mistake you know it's like yeah. a bad joke yeah it's a, like it's really bad joke so um that tell them which one uh they tell me it's a hepatocellular carcinoma it's a very strange type of cancer to have the liver liver cancer to have uh, and mostly most people who have it as have been exposed to some as a chemical called asbestos hey, that means they have to be working in some coal mine or some factory somewhere but also they could have been they were figuring they were thinking i was an excessive drinker of alcohol which is a problem because that is what is called cirrhotic liver cancer and they kept asking me and i don't think they believed until later on when my grandmother came on thursday and told them i know my son I, I don't think he drinks yeah if he, if he was drinking i would know even if he was trying to hide it you know and they kept asking me are you are you sure you don't drink are you sure you don't smoke because there was no way they were ruling out smoking and narcotics and you know alcohol and it's just not alcohol it's excessive alcohol you know yeah they, they, were, they were sort of trying to to find what is it called a cushion to justify yeah, to justify my diagnosis yeah. so there's a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of information that goes into breaking the information too. and i think aga khan did a very good job they came with the team and there was a nutritionist there was an oncologist there was a psychologist and all these thorough. people were they were thorough and they were very human about it i think i loved that they, they really took care of yeah and uh, i think i I, I find it because most cases most cases that I've been able to handle through therapy because I also talk to a lot of cancer survivors and people who are like newly diagnosed the way they are told I th- it's like it's like a death sentence for you like yeah you have cancer and the doctor walks away whatever. yeah whatever man just deal with your shit so you know sometimes and, and it's, it's unfair because yeah, it's very unfair. You, you battled it for yeah. like for, for yeah. now eight years yeah. now so yeah. it's not like it's a death sentence yeah it's not a death sentence I I always say it's it's a life sentence. It's a life sentence because at that moment you realize that every breath from that moment counts. Yeah? Every day, every small way. You know that days you stuck, but this you really sick and if you can move this leg, if I can move this leg out of that bed and breathe and go to the shower and not even shower, maybe sometimes just sit on the bowl and just as be with my thoughts. That's a huge win for me. Health is well. Yeah, yeah. So those are very th- small subtle things that many people tend to like you no know, take for granted or not necessarily think about because they're very minute they're very small and you tend to neglect thinking about them like wow but breathing how many people think about how they breathe actually there's not very few people like and the days of life. yeah the days are feel the days are practice what is called you know the technique of breathing you know just breathe in and and just deep and deep until until you feel like choking and you breathe out you feel like relieved you feel like you can test your own breath yeah and that's a really that's a beautiful thing to experience no matter how much the body is fighting with pain and 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 and, 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 and sickness and, and no matter how life might be difficult beyond that breath yeah. i mean that's a good thing to appreciate so the first person that you told was your grandmother yes how did she take the news Well, she was I didn't tell her. I didn't tell her, of course. I don't know when we were going to the hospital. I called her for one hour. I think I was I was just seated at at you know the trenches of a local people playing at the football field the day I was I was I had requested to be discharged so that I come back with somebody who we can you know share the news with. And you know life was just going normal for the other students. So I was going to class, even in classes I was playing, I was you know having the jobs and you I was just imagining, yeah, I was just imagining how can life be this way? Like here I'm dealing with the very pretty bad news and other people were just rolling. I was just imagining what 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 bad thing is going on in these people's lives. Life does not yeah, it um, doesn't stop for and you. And that's what I always <laughs> say, it, life can be so unfair. Yes, yeah, so I think that was that moment I was also I was very meditative person and I like thinking a lot of sometimes I'm an overthinker so I was thinking I was thinking this is the point where I either have to carry my grief because it was it was grief actually I started mourning my my loss I started mourning because I knew now because school was very important to me I had a well laid out plan after four years I'm doing my masters I wanted to do my PhD by age 28 you know I was I just, it was a typical nerd well 
you, that's a label you're giving me. <laughs> <laughs> that's you, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had this laid out flat, and now something has come that I sort of seemingly will threaten my layout plan. The only person I knew, like intimately, was some young mother who's my, my, she used to go to church with my grandmother. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1984 and she's still alive up to date. That's the only cancer survivor I've ever known that I've like gone. Of course, there are others that I, I had heard about, but most of them didn't make it far. So that that's continued to like bother me. Yeah. yeah. So I decided let, it's just my grief and I have to have, I either have to process it I will take time to process my grief and, and be with it. It's like uh, this roommate that you didn't invite, but now they're so there you with have you. have to embrace yeah, it and make love yeah, to it. Yeah. And, just... and learn, learn them, you know. And give it a hug. Yeah, give it a hug. And that's, that's what I did in that evening. And then after that, I did a one-hour call talking to my grandmother. We were talking about absurd stuff. Where the... Have you planted? Yeah. You know? <laughs> stuff. Just going around. Mm-hmm. I was telling her, I thought of about grandpa today, you know. Yeah, you know, I thought about him. Just staff. Yeah. And then I told her, I want you to travel because I think there's something we need to hear together. I was like, wow, is it okay? You just tell me now. I was like, okay, but I just want you to travel. And I was like, okay, I'll send you some money. You travel. And then she traveled on Thursday. Yeah, and then we went to the hospital. That's the time I told her when we were driving to the hospital. We told her, yeah, I got this news. And uh, we're going to know what our treatment plan yes what was the reaction she was broken for real she was broken i mean i'm, I'm my grand, grandmother's last one in a way you are you are her main yeah i'm a main i'm a main man <laughs> yes but uh, and i think i'm very i'm very uh, hopeful i'm uh, i'm a hope in many homes i've lived i've lived with my aunties i've lived with my uncles i've lived with a lot of people right. and in those homes i've been a hope to them have been something they see as like one day. I've, I've been a one day to them. One day, this 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 will be great. This story will be great. And uh, obviously, like like her, I think I think we both felt disheartened. Like you know, this this, this is now really hard. But we we'll go through it together. You know. So so, what has life been like after? Life after cancer. How how did it change now? Well, it didn't change me much. I think it just more sort of revealed me. Yeah. I became more thoughtful, I became more aware, I became more vulnerable over and over because I was also learning to tell my story. Up to this point, very few knew that I had a child, very few knew that I had lost my girlfriend. And I was learning to tell these stories because I am one person who is very strong, not because I like to 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 Mwanaume, no, I don't like I don't catch that vibe. I like Toxic to, masculinity. No <laughs> I like to I, I like to process something. Up to a moment, I'm deciding to tell a luoch. I I'm very ready to take care of you because you are only receiving it for the first time, and I'm, I've gone through it. So I want to be a support system when I'm telling you. And I also like to protect other people. And I'm a strong person. I've been told, and I believe I'm a strong person. My cancer was inoperable. Usually, if it was operable, we would have done a transplant. Or we would, we would have done something called a resection. They would have cut part of my liver where it's affected. Yeah. Away with that. Yeah, it would, it would, yeah, it would grow back. But now it was inoperable. The moment we would have put a knife on it, that would be like a really, like, now a death sentence. So we had to, to leave Kubembeleza, your tumor is shrink kidogo. That's when we could maybe think of a resection or a transplant. Yes, and it took quite some years, two years to be precise. Because chemo is very funny. Chemo is more like, it's the poison that is supposed to help your body, supposed to fight the tumors. But that same, same drug can also like have very detrimental effects on your body, on your good cell, yeah. So sometimes we had to stop when the immunity is on a crunch. Sometimes you're really sick. Sometimes you have blood pressure is so high or other things have cropped up so you can't do your chemo as well as was uh, like uh, prescribed. So you have to take maybe a break. And that's why sometimes it takes a longer period for you to complete your sessions. Yeah, but I did both chemo and radio and I lost my hair, I got so thin, I lost 21 kgs. I was like super thin, but I insisted I have to still go to class. 
I I think the moment that there was an exam I did on 13th of December, there was a cut. That is the moment I sort of realized, well, this thing has now started to affect important aspects of my life. This means I will have to defer at some point. And deferring has always been tough for most people. Like you see your classmates are going on with their I'm lives. moving forward and yeah, you and you. Yeah, you, you're stuck. And uh, it was tough for me. Yeah, and uh, it was really life clarifying. It was, I call it, there's a painting I have that is called Lethal Clarity. My cancer diagnosis was lethal to my life, to my being, to my person. But it brought clarity to my life. It brought things that I needed to put in order. It brought that I needed to live a healthy life. It needed I needed to mend relationships that were broken. I needed to be a good person. Uh, in fact, even better than I have been before. I needed to be aware. I needed to be more conscious. I needed to be more myself. It was like a wake-up call. Yeah, it was a wake-up call, you know. Like, hey, snap, you wake up. Last this is life now. Reality. This is life now, yeah. This is it. Yeah, this is it now. It's, it's not any other. This is your life now. And I thought I'd just carry it in the line with it. Nice. Yeah. So, um, how many, what is it called? Have, have you ever heard relapse? Yes. Is relapse the right term? They call it a remission. Remission. I've never yeah. had... No, I've never had a remission, but I had a possible remission in 2017 after I went to India. And uh, my my condition was sort of very, very much improved. Uh, actually, it's, it's what you see now, because pre-2017 was a very tough period. Between 2011 and 2017 was a very tough period. That's around the same period that I met you, yeah, right? Yeah, yes, yes. So uh, it, it went really well in India. We did more advanced medical treatment, we did brachytherapy, we did keyhole surgery, because now they couldn't cut my liver directly, they did way, way ultra-modern medical techniques. Mm. And that sort of like breathed life into me. And uh, I came back and I even went back to school. I was feeling more alive, you know? Yeah, so, I, I, and then in 2018, it started to spread back, you know, just spreading. It's called a metastasis. Right. Yes. Crazy. So right now it's spreading back. Yeah, that's it's spreading now. It's in the bones and uh, the blood. Oh. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So you're trying another treatment. Yeah, we're trying another treatment. We're also looking at the possibility of having a stem cell transplant. Oh, that would make it better. That would make it better. But now we have to fly again. So there's a lot of things to be considered, especially finance, because yeah. it's been a rough journey. It's been like actually financially have you have you ever sought medical services mm -hmm. as a cancer patient in a government hospital yeah what is it like it's it's hell it's hell but well, let's break it down one thing most of my treatment at the government facility have been done at knh kenyatta and to be honest kenyatta is like right now the only referral okay there's Eldoret, there's Russia, but now capacity. Let's like just let's take KNH and break it down. There's something called primary healthcare. Primary healthcare is what has made Cuba, countries that Germany, even India, have made them very much at a better position to handle health crisis. As as for us, it's very rare because I remember there's a time I went home. I'll talk about it because, you know, like I told you, stories connect. Yeah. In 2015, I went home to die because I had exhausted virtually everything I could have thought, thought about. Like finances. Finances. My insurance had run out. I was being covered by my mom, and my pension for my grandmother was, like, run out. So when I went home... So you just went home. It was just... I was wait just, for your face. It was just, yeah, wait for it. Like you guys... Yeah, yeah like... There's it, no yeah, way out. There's no way out. That's, that's a very sad place And sometimes, be. yeah, it's a very sad place. It, it, sometimes it would be... It would be so hard. I had to be taken to a dispensary. And the only... The best thing they could give you are two paracetamol for your pain. So you see, there's somebody that has climbed, let's say, from Meru or Kilifi, from some small dispensary in the village. Kidogo, 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 kidogo. If they're lucky, they will survive to maybe a district hospital or a county level hospital. But if they're not lucky, they won't make it there, they will die. Because you go back, you go back, they give you another another you know set of paracetamol or brufen or this, you know, these drugs. So I remember 
you know, seeking my treatment, there are times I would go to KNH. First of all, so that time school was still paying for it. So I would go to the CM or the chief medical officer, they write you some note because you can't go without it. Then you go to the revenue office, you panga line with the prison people, and then you go back to, to wait with the doctor. I would get out of KNH at 12 a.m. and I've not seen a doctor. I think one, we need information because there's a lot of myths. Cancer still is being attached to HIV.